I didn't put two and two together. I didn't, you know, see anything wrong with my diet. And part of the reason is because once you become vegan, quite frequently you start entering what I call the vegan echo chamber. And that's a, almost a cult like community where all of your friends are vegan, where you're going to vegan events, where you start making your whole life revolve around this. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. I'm your host, Lee Brandon. This work started for me several decades ago when I started to see the impact I could make on people, helping them to identify the root cause of their health problems that no doctor could figure out, including serious back, knee, shoulder and neck injuries, acne and eczema issues, severe gut health problems, even helping couples get pregnant after several IVF treatments had failed. And it really moves me to be able to help people in this way. And that is why I do what I do and why we have this show. In this week's episode, I invited the recovering vegan, aka Giselle Bissom, to discuss her experience as a long-term vegan. I first came across Giselle on her Twitter page, The Recovering Vegan, and found her posts very interesting, open and honest of her experience of being a long-term vegan. In this episode, Giselle explains in detail the effects a vegan lifestyle had on her, why she stopped living a vegan lifestyle, and what she's doing now as an ex-vegan to optimise her health. I'm sure you'll enjoy this very open and honest discussion about Giselle's experience as a vegan. Giselle Bisson, welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. It's good to be here. Good morning. <laughs> so yeah, I've really been looking forward to this uh, episode for some time. So Giselle, could you, you know, to kick things off, could you share with the audience an overview of your own journey leading up to where you are today as a journalist and a creator of the Twitter page, The Recovering Vegan? Well, it all kind of happened by accident. Um, I I was not expecting to become a, a health and nutrition influencer or a, a, one of the world's most famous ex-vegans. That was something that happened to me. And now I kind of see it as maybe on, on some level, this is one of my uh, life you know, in the journey of life, maybe this was one of my life purposes and everything that I did up until this point uh, prepared me for this. So I, I started my career as a journalist, uh, mostly working in the technology industry in Silicon Valley. And um, after, uh, you know, working really, really hard and a long uh, uh, career, I went off on a personal spiritual journey and that journey started with veganism and I went to this uh, hot springs retreat in Northern California um, and uh, started studying vegan cooking. Uh, I took a vegan cooking class and uh, I was interested in changing my career. I was sort of burnt out, stressed out and uh, was exploring cooking which is something I've always loved, cooking food. And um, took this vegan culinary academy and learned how to make green smoothies and learned how to make juice and and how to make my own cheeses out of nuts, you know, nut cheese, nut milk. This was in uh, 2002. And at this time, there was no word vegan in the public vernacular. We didn't have vegan restaurants. We didn't have vegan products at all in the stores. And um, we were making everything from scratch. So after this, this cooking workshop, I was so transformed and just so, you know, just sparkling from the experience. The food was delicious. And I became a vegan overnight. Uh, it was just a very rapid decision to change my life and and become vegan. I I had been a vegetarian though primarily up until that point. Mm -hmm. And um, so so we're talking, you know, vegetarian. I'm 60 years old. I was vegetarian since you know the early 1980s. Um, I had brief periods of time here and there where I ate meat because I was in a relationship with a partner who made me or I went to an event where it was served, but 
mostly for most of my life, I was a, a, a lacto ovo vegetarian and then a, a strict raw vegan. Yeah. Was there was there one sp- specific thing that kind of made you think, right, this is for me. This is this is what I want to do. Was there was there one specific kind of event or something that happened that really sparked that, right, this this is my lifestyle now? Well, I I went to France in nineteen eighty nine, two thousand, and um and was traveling throughout the country with a French chef and culinary, he was a culinary expert. Uh, it's what you call an agronomist. He was educated to be a government agronomy consultant. And um, so he taught me all about agriculture, about biologic, organic agriculture, and French cooking, French food. And we traveled all over the country. It was an extraordinary experience. And I ate really, really good food. When I came back to the United States after after this experience of, of um, one day I remember while I was in France, his mother cooked me foie gras, which we know is mm-hmm. the livers of ducks that have been fed a very rich diet. So the, the it's exceptionally fatty. I have foie gras for breakfast with champagne. That's champ France, real French cooking in the south of France. Mm-hmm. It's very high in fat. Mm-hmm. And we ate a, a number of different um, animal foods that I'd never experienced before in the United States, everything from frogs to one day we were walking on the beach and we gathered um, a sea urchin, or shan, or shan, and we ate them like sushi straight from the shell on the beach. And so what I was really learning is the original hunter-gatherer culture, the original hunter-gatherer cuisine, which wasn't necessarily, you know, really big animals with a bow and arrow hunting. What humans did is they went to the beach and they gathered coquilles, small little animals. One day we had escargot for breakfast, uh, escargot for breakfast, which was was garden snails. We gathered mm-hmm. garden snails and then you put them in a little sort of like a terrarium and you fatten them up with cornmeal and clean them out for a while. And once they get a little bit bigger, um, you you eat them with garlic butter. And um, I thought that was disgusting. You know, this was coming from years as a vegetarian before I, I came to France. And I ate these things to be polite, mostly. You know, I had to be polite. Um, and uh, my health was thriving there. It was really beautiful, healthy, strong. My hair looked great. You know, uh, I was swimming in the Mediterranean, long distance swimming and had incredible energy and my skin was taking the sun really well. But when I came back to the United States, I went to a standard American grocery store. And after shopping in these little boutiques, as you, you know, you're European, you know, the food is extraordinary in Europe. It can be, it can also be mm. big box stores like it is here in the U S. Mm-hmm. But at that time we just had regular uh, grocery stores in the United States. We didn't have the culinary revolution that's happened since then. And I walked into the grocery store and just the smell of the meat department just made me, you know, and the way it looked, the way it smelled, um, everything just sort of in a wrapper looking really mass produced and sad. And I started reading books and we didn't have all these uh, documentary films like we have now to convince people to be vegan. But there were a couple of um, seminal books at that time. And one was uh, Diet for a New Planet, I think it is, or Diet for a Small Planet, Francis Moore LaPay. I also read John Robbins. And I read a book that was popular at the time, a bestseller called Fast Food Nation. And I remember at night reading this book uh, late at night, the chapter on uh the 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 slaughterhouse and how the animals were treated and the, the slaughterhouse conditions and i literally felt sick to my stomach you know like nauseated as i was reading this chapter and that was was i think you know one of the pivotal moments where i realized something you know that 
consciously and spiritually I couldn't take the energy of these tortured, sad animals into my body and make my body from them. It was okay in France when it was this very high caliber um, agriculture, which we were often getting direct from the farm because we lived out in the countryside north of Provence in this uh, region called the Ardèche. And we also mm-hmm. traveled a lot in Provence and lived in the south. And we got our fish directly from the fishermen, you know, things that I couldn't do once I was back in San Francisco at that time. So so in France, the, it sounds like the food was good quality. It was fresh. You know, it's from kind of oh, natural, yeah. so, natural sources. What for you was the difference when you got back to America that kind of, you know, where you said, well, that's not for me anymore. What, what, was, what do you think was the difference? It was all just the... Um, it's hard to describe to a European how awful the American grocery stores were around <laughs> 2002. <laughs> Um, I can imagine. It just, just, yeah, stuff that's mass produced from factory farms. And another thing that would really um, jar me is when I was driving from Los Angeles to San Francisco along the, the freeway there, there's a place where you go past one of the largest concentrated agriculture feeding operations, CAFOs. In the United States, it's where they bring the animals for slaughter and they fatten them up with grains. And they're just stewing in their own feces and urine in Mm -hmm. this giant lot crammed together. And you can see it from the freeway and smell it. And I remember my French fiancé, the agronomist, when he traveled with me in the United States and we drove past that, he started crying. He was so horrified. He just, it, when he saw an American grocery store and, and the quality of the food in the grocery store, he was appalled. Mm. Now, all of that has changed in the last 20 years. You know, we have mm. great, uh, we have great selection, incredible products now available in um, stores throughout the United States, both, both plant-based and um, uh animal-based and that's because the consumers have been demanding it Mm. there's been a revolution yeah so for you it was it was more of a spiritual decision than a health decision would that be right or or not well i didn't i i thought it was a health decision i mean i was Mm. vain i was you know just turning in early 40s, it's when that age when you're a woman and you start to to feel your youth slipping away, your beauty slipping away. So, yeah, maybe part of it was motivated by ma- vanity. Um, being vegan, especially raw vegan, is a very easy way to be super thin. Um, and, uh, you know, it was presented by what you know, the people uh, promoting this and um, selling their products and supplements like David Wolf. He had a book called Eating for Beauty. It, it was definitely sold to us as a, a way to be beautiful. The celebrities were doing it like Demi Moore and Madonna, you know, and um, this was really being pushed at that time as this sort of radical uh, life extension experience but also i was practicing yoga i was very involved in the spiritual community going to ashrams meditating and this i was starting to have this kind of spiritual awakening and so the the idea of ahimsa nonviolence to all beings um incorporating that through my diet um you know the idea that the planet might benefit from these choices okay so which we now know is not really true but at the time that's what i i was reading in these books like by francis moore lapay and john robinson i was um seeing lectures by dr gabriel cousins i was following these people around like a groupie Mm. so so this you said was about 20 years ago that you became vegan is that right Yes. 
Okay. And, and when you first started, how, how were things for you initially? Well, you feel great at first. I mean, for the first couple of days, um, you know, you detox and um, you get off all of the junk food and you're only eating organic fruits and vegetables. The food, at least in this culinary academy, was incredible, very exquisite, you know, four-star caliber restaurant food we were learning how to prepare. But, you know, looking back, it was mostly sugar. And I think the Mm -hmm. reason we felt so good is it was sugar high. And you're also eating a lot of chocolate. I mean, a lot of caffeine, um, various caffeinated beverages were, and you know, mushroom elixirs and um, all kinds of different teas, you know, were really popular in, in the vegan community. Um, desserts made with raw cacao, you know, super concentrated cacao. Um, a lot of desserts, a lot of fruit smoothies. You're, you're running on sugar. You're high on sugar. Mm. So, so initially you felt good. Mm-hmm. Did you notice any any kind of like bodily changes? Well, you're in the bathroom a lot. <laughs> um, you know, you're. I you're... mean, did your body did your body shape change? Oh yes, I became. Um, and at the time, you know, I thought this was great. I lost, I lost my breasts. I became like flat chested. I was really thin. Um, you know, you could bounce a quarter off my butt. I was doing yoga all the time and I was, um, very low body fat and, uh, super thin, like a lot of the actresses that we try to emulate, like, um, Sarah Jessica Parker, Madonna, you know, we see these models with these bodies and, um, yeah, I, I, you know, looking back at what happened at the time, I, I would say it was definitely an eating disorder for me. I became um, quite anorexic. And as I got thinner and thinner, my friends and family were alarmed. Um, people started, you know, whispering to me, maybe you're getting a little thin. I, the weight loss was pretty rapid and dramatic. And then I started getting really spaced out. Uh, couldn't concentrate, couldn't focus, got very accident prone, was getting in sort of minor accidents. Um, I dropped uh, one morning. I was so spaced out. I spilled my green tea on my leg, um, burned over 15% of my body, had to go to the emergency room, went into shock. Uh, You know, these things, these were happening and it, I didn't put two and two together. I didn't, you know, see anything wrong with my diet. And part of the reason is because once you become vegan, quite frequently you start entering what I call the vegan echo chamber. And that's a, almost a cult-like community where all of your friends are vegan, where you're going mm-hmm. to vegan events, where you start making your whole life revolve around this mm-hmm. in a very um it, in such a way that you don't get any you don't get the other side you don't hear yeah. any information anymore yeah. you're following vegan doctors and vegan yeah. gurus so so how long how long would you say you actually felt good when you switched to vegan how long did that last probably about 6 months okay so from what you've said, it sounds like, you know, you probably wasn't getting enough fat and protein from your diet. And it sounds like your body was probably metabolizing its own protein from muscle tissue. It sounds like your brain wasn't getting the fuel that it needed. Mm -mm. So you felt good for six months. Things started going downhill from then. How, How long did that kind of continue for? Well, I started getting very, I mean, if I remember the first changes uh, when I shifted to a vegan diet, I was cold all the time. Hmm. I would be cold even in bright sunlight. Um, I started having um, very uh, severe um, fainting episodes. I remember I would faint, black out. Um, 
even had a fainting episode once where I woke up and the EMTs were standing over me. Um, I would lose things. I remember once I lost my car keys while I was shopping in a grocery store and I actually dropped them in the, I later found them in the freezer department, like near the uh, wow. <laughs> frozen fruit or something. But that's how spaced out I was. It just was, my brain wasn't functioning. Um, I was, you know, and you get this kind of airy, fairy spaciness that goes with the spiritual journey. You know, you feel high from the the lack of, of nutrition. Um, mm. I was very, um, my hair started breaking off and falling off. It got very thin, it sort of falling out in clumps. It wouldn't grow, you know, past a certain length anymore. Now it's down. It's growing all the way down the middle of my back. Yeah. But um, it started just just breaking. Um, my skin was horrible. I had, you know, now I'm 60, I have great skin. But in my vegan years, and you'll see this a lot on Instagram, you'll see vegan girls with and guys with giant blotches pink blotches all over their face and cystic acne. And these cysts are hard. You you can't pop them. There's no fluid in them. They're not like a regular pimple. They're like a hard mm. cyst, cystic yeah. acne. Not sure what um, they're called. Uh, problems with um, iron deficiency, anemia, mm. mm -hmm. um, severe bleeding. Uh, first, your menstrual period becomes very scanty. And um, what the vegans in the community would say is oh that's good you're detoxing you don't need that nasty period anyway that's just your body detoxing uh disgusting meat that you ate before you're detoxing that out of your body and um the loss of your menstrual period shows that you're clean <laughs> not not that you're cult -like, not healthy enough to cult like you're... programming i would call yeah. that so ra um, rather than it's, I'm not healthy enough to reproduce because you obviously, it's not good for the species if you reproduce unhealthy children. It's not that. It's oh, it's it's a good thing. Right, you, you're literally losing your ability to ovulate during a time in your life when when you should still be fertile. Um, mm. And some women around me were going into premature perimenopause. Mm. Um, loss of breast tissue, you know, where my breasts were literally like deflated, um, almost uh, empty, um, you know, flat as a boy. Um, let's see. Wow. I mean, a bruising um, skin so fragile that that it bleeds practically wow. you know, bruises when you touch it. Your skin bleeds and bleeds and bleeds. Um, unable to get new, any energy, uh, no matter how much coffee or stimulants you take into your body, they don't work. Mm. Coffee so, doesn't give you boost anymore. So, when you went vegan, so you've been you've been vegetarian for a while. You went vegan for six months. You felt good. How long did it take before the penny dropped and you kind of thought, hang on a minute, maybe the way that I feel is to do with what I'm eating? It took me 18 years. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I know that sounds really stupid. You know, somebody has declining health, one health problem after another, but what you end up doing in the vegan community, it's all vegan all the time. All your friends are vegan. You start only dating vegans. Um, everybody around you is sick all the time. And they're all complaining about their health problems. So this becomes normalized. Poor health and the very specific kinds of, of health problems you and your friends have become, ah, it's just a normal life, right? And the denial is so deep because you really think you, you have the most superior diet. You're doing the best thing for your body. 
nutritionally, for the planet, spiritually. So the last thing that you look at as the answer to your health issues or your mental issues or your psychological issues is your diet. Um, Also, uh, the vegan community is really into supplements. And not only are you being told, well, take this supplement or that supplement for this issue. And this would happen even when I saw a healthcare professional. For example, you know, early on in my vegan journey, when I was cold, when I was having um, amenorrhea, you know, I saw a holistic health practitioner, Ayurvedic practitioner. The first thing he said is you need to eat eggs. Eat eggs, eat butter. Um, He said, get some omega-3 fatty acids. Mm. And I laughed at him. I'm like, no way. I'm not eating eggs and butter. Mm. I'm not eating fish or or cod liver oil. You need the cholesterol to make your steroid hormones. Right. Mm. There you go. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of times, you know, now you're seeing interviews on on YouTube and and uh, more and more long term ex vegans coming out, and it's sad, you know, to look at what a lot of these women look like. They're really shriveled, um, very very bad skin, um, you know, emaciated or obese. On the other side, you see, and and you see people with 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 struggling with um, very hard to solve health problems. Mm. Um, but it takes many, many, many years uh, for some of these problems to manifest in the body from the chronic malnutrition and from what we're now learning are the anti nutrients mm. in yeah. plants. Yeah, and which, nobody which was I, talking about anti nutrients at that time. Yeah, which I spoke in detail with Jane Buxton uh, on on the podcast mm-hmm. previously about all the anti anti nutrients. She's a real authority on that, and so is Sally Norton, um, who wrote the recent book that was released in January about oxalates, mm. toxic superfoods. Yeah. And, you know, the thought that superfoods are toxic, wow, back in the early 2000s, that would have, I would have been in total denial about that because I was buying superfoods right and left thinking, oh, wow, we've found the fountain of youth here, you know, goji berries, mm. goji juice, and your friends are inviting you to goji juice parties where they're passing out samples of goji juice and trying to get you to buy their $50 a bottle goji juice, their noni juice, their, um, you know, everyone's coming back from South America with some latest discovery of what uh, people have been eating Uh in the Amazon jungle or, or China or, you know, some exotic place has this, this very expensive, food that will make you beautiful and live forever buy it for me now um and then there are a lot of mlm multi-level marketing programs Mm -hmm. and pyramid schemes that that um float around the vegan community and a lot of these revolve around um, various forms of blue green algae and and uh, spirulina so and various green powders, and I was taking all of this stuff. I had the big jars mm. of the green powder, which I mixed into my green smoothie, and my green drinks every morning. I had the these um, uh, superfood powders, um, concentrations of camu camu, and it, there was always some new thing that came out, oh. and it would make you feel a little bit better temporarily, maybe mostly because of the sugar or or I mean, I mean, to read Sally's book now and realize that I was poisoning myself and filling my joints with oxalates and mm. anti nutrients for many, many years from from these these toxic superfoods. So you were suffering. You were suffering from joint pain as well. It took years to develop, but it mm. it started creeping up on me. Yeah. yeah. When 35-year-old Amanda first scheduled to see me, 
She'd been suffering for 19 years from severe IBS, diarrhea and faecal incontinence, along with abdominal pain and bloating. Her condition had not only made life uncomfortable for Amanda, but very inconvenient as she had to walk two hours to work every day along a route that had public toilets, and she'd never been on holiday as an adult because of her condition. The only advice that several doctors and specialists had given Amanda was to take Imodium, and when she first saw me, she was taking five Imodium a day and wasn't getting any better. To help Amanda, I ran tests to find out what foods were right for her metabolic type, to see which foods she was sensitive to, and to assess her gut microbiome. Tests showed that Amanda had several food sensitivities and a parasite infection. Over the coming weeks, I coached Amanda to eat right of her type and to replace the food she was sensitive to and a protocol to deal with her parasite infection. And after three months, Amanda was IBS free and she also reported her skin was much improved and she had lost weight. And she booked a holiday for her and her husband to New York as they'd never been on a proper honeymoon because of her IBS. And if you're suffering like Amanda was and you want to get to the root cause of your problem, you can arrange a consultation with me at www.bodycheck.co.uk. And if we're a good fit, I could help you achieve the same kind of results as Amanda. Now, back to the podcast. Yeah, I mean, I've got no... I've got no dogma over nutrition. So, you know, obviously I work with people with nutrition and I, I would never say to anyone, this is the right diet for you, right? I, I, I coach people to find out what's right for them. Mm -hmm. So if it turned out that someone did best on a vegan diet, I would be like, fine, great. If If that's the best diet for you, you go for it. And when I interviewed Jane Buxton, I asked her the question, I said, how many, so I've I've been doing something called metabolic typing for 19 years now. Mm -hmm. And I said to Jane, how many people do you think I've coached that it turns out that a vegan or vegetarian diet was optimal for them? And she said, and I can't remember what she said, maybe she said 10 or 20 or something like that, or a hundred, I can't remember. But the answer is zero. Right. Now, listen, I've, I've coached, vegetarians i've coached vegans as well Mm -hmm. um i can think of one who was kind of like she was just not willing to make the changes she needed to 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 make to to heal herself you know and that that relationship ended which is fine but i can think of another two people who are vegetarian that i've worked with that got pretty good results one of them was quite healthy in the first place i mean i i used to basically work with him on the exercise side of things. And he was very knowledgeable in terms of nutrition. And, you know, he would use a lot of the supplements that he needed because his diet was was uh, deficient. He'd never, ever eaten meat in his life. But what was interesting that I found, he always had niggles. So I was always having to do manual therapy on him like every session. And he was extremely weak. I mean, he was a very good athlete but unbelievably weak, like one of the weakest people I've ever trained in the gym. Hmm. You know, he was, I can't remember how old he would have been at the time, maybe late thirties or something like that. You know, I can't, most of the women I've trained in their sixties have been stronger than him. And I found that really, really interesting. And, And I feel like if I'd have tried to push him any harder, I probably would have broken him, you know? He was spending a fortune on supplements, which which he needed, oh, yeah. but he was spending a lot of money. Yeah, I was spending a fortune on supplements too. And I remember I would run out of food sometimes and only have big boxes of supplements in the house. And you couldn't eat them on an empty stomach without without the food. Mm. But it, it, yeah. the food became sort of the way to... to to uh, hold the stum- the supplements in. Yeah. yeah. Such a belief in the power of these supplements, that they're superior to food, that food is unnecessary. I don't know where this came from. You know, this, these thought processes. Yeah, I find that interesting because, you know, one of the things that can be very useful to do when it comes to health is to look back and say, well, how did we evolve as a species? Mm -hmm. Right. Because the way that we got here, 
you know, we, we've spent six million years at least to get to this stage. We, we must have been doing something right. Now, obviously, modern lifestyle has made a lot of changes to the way that we live. You know, most of us don't have to hunt and gather to, to eat food, for instance. And we, you know, mobile phones and, and chairs and cars and all that kind of stuff coming in. But when you look back, how did we get here? Well, we hunted animals and we gathered, you know, fruit, vegetables, nuts, seeds, I guess. I don't know about seeds, but certainly nuts we would have would have gathered. We gathered animals is what we gathered. Yeah, we gathered. yeah as you, that as you mentioned earlier. That would have been priority, not little seeds. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And we certainly didn't survive or we didn't evolve on supplements, right? And, you know, when you when you look at it as well, in terms of evolution, well, the, the reason we became humans was because there was – a reduction in temperature in the world and a lot of the rainforest in Africa disappeared and there's all these apes no longer had any trees. So you either adapt or you die. So because they didn't have all this vegetation, they only had another choice, which was to eat animals. And then over a long period of time, we also became more and more upright in our stance and could walk on and run on two legs then we became fantastic hunters as well, right? Yes, we would have gathered, of course, but we also hunted. You know, I know everyone, I'm sure most people are familiar with the persistent persistence hunt, which is how we would have hunted animals, you know, thousands of years ago. And well, there, there are still people in Africa now that do persistence hunting, like the natives. Now, what is persistence hunting? So, persistence hunting is when, see, the, the advantage we have in terms of our evolution mm-hmm. is that. Because we didn't have fur and because we're upright, we could handle the heat, the midday sun in Africa. So if you think of a, of a four-legged animal like a lion, what do they do at midday in Africa? They, they lay down under the sun. They, they, they get into the shade and they lie down and they rest because it's too hot for them. Imagine wearing a fur coat in that weather, you know, when it's boiling hot. The other thing about mammals, most four-legged mammals, is their back – is getting a lot of sunshine. So it's really heating them up. And obviously they don't sweat like we do, right? So when we're upright, we we get a very small amount of our body in direct sunlight. So the top of our head, maybe our nose, our shoulders, and our feet. Whereas a four-legged mammal, it's the whole of their back and their head that's in the sun. The other thing is when a mammal runs, it runs in the sagittal plane, what we call up and down. Well, when a human runs, we run in what's called the transverse plane. So we're not going so much against gravity. So we're a lot more efficient at running than mammals. Yes, some of them can sprint faster than us, but none of them can run as far as we can. Or throw. What's that? We can throw a spear. We can, but but that that would have come in much later in our evolution. So with Mm -hmm. the persistence hunt, what, what you do is you... You see, say, a, um, a herd of, of deer in the distance, and what you would do is you'd run after them. And, of course, they're going to run away. But because of our superior brains, if you like, from eating meat, because our brains grew when we started eating meat, what we were able to do, we were able to, to track the, the footprints. So then we would follow the footprints, and then we'd go, oh, there they are. And you'd run after them again. And basically, you would chase them until one of them dropped dead in the heat. My goodness, really? I've never heard of that. And then you take the animal back and then, you know, if it was before fire, you'd probably eat just eat it raw. And then once we had fire, you pro- they probably would have cooked it and, and then ate it. So that's that's the persistent hunt. So that's that's how we got here, right? So in it's very it's very important not to ignore how we evolved as a species because the further you move away from that the the further you're moving away from health you know the further you move away from your natural environment which includes you know clean air clean water clean soil right you know if we're poisoning our farm soils we're poisoning our food supply we're poisoning we are po- we are poisoning our waterways you know we have to drink right, right. so 
it's really important to get back to how we evolved. And an eating right for our type generally involves eating in a similar way to your ancestors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I look at myself, I've got fair skin, I've got blue eyes, I've got light brown hair. Most of my ancestors probably came from a very cold part of the world, mm -hmm. right? Well, if you come from a cold part of the world, the ground freezes for part of the year, there's no vegetation. So how do you survive? But there's only one way. That's that's to eat animals. Or so, raise them indoors. Well in barns. Yeah, but I'm i I'm talking how we how we evolved, right? Right. So my ancestors for tens of thousands of years would have evolved eating a predominantly animal based diet. Mm -hmm. Now now if I if I tried to go on a, a plant based diet, I know that I'm not going to do very well on that. You know, I, I mean, I did a, I did a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat. You know, I went vegetarian for 10 days. I lost eight kilos in weight and my waist was eight inches bigger in 10 days. <laughs> right. Lose weight, but get fatter. Veganism. And I was, Yay. And I was exhausted. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you a funny story and it might be a, a bit too much information for most people, but I'm going to say it anyway. So when I, when I would go into the, cause, cause on these Vipassana meditations, the men and the women are split. They're not in the same, same area. So mm -hmm. you go into the men's toilet. And I remember at the end, at the end of the 10 days, when the men and the women are allowed to speak to each other, I, I was speaking to a couple of ladies and I said to them, I said, Oh, for the last 10 days, the men's toilet has sounded like an umpire band. Right, you know, like the brass instruments, right? <laughs> and, and and the lady said to me, the ladies didn't sound any different to us. You know? Well, you 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 end up uh you know, if you've ever walked behind behind a horse or ridden a horse, you notice that they're continually pooping, right? And it's mostly filled with plants. Mm. And that's what happens to you when you're a plant-based eater. Mm. Same thing because you're ingesting so much fiber. Yeah. And I learned the hard way that what that fiber does to you after, you know, 18 years of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean my my body needs a lot of fat and a lot of protein. You know, and it's not it's not a it's not a dogma thing. You know, I I Occasionally, I try eating a slightly higher carbohydrate diet. It just doesn't doesn't work for me. Right. You know, I put on body fat easy. I, I I don't have any energy. You know, I'm very gassy. Like people know not to feed me potatoes for that reason. You know, my my body just doesn't suit that kind of diet. Now, I'm not I'm not saying you know I've had clients that have done very well on a predominantly plant based diet. They still eat an, a little bit of animal foods. Mm -hmm. But some people do really well on that. Everyone's different. So for me, there's no dogma. But from what you're saying, from what you're saying about your vegan experience, there's a lot of dogma in the vegan community. Absolutely. And a lot of denial yeah. and a lot of fear around eating animals. Mm. Fear that it will hurt you, that it's dirty, that it's bad. Mm. And so. Uh, reintroducing animal foods is very, 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 very difficult for vegans. And yeah. some just can't do it. And yeah. they end up, as I say, veganing to the grave. Um, yeah, I mean, veganing to I the have, early grave. I have friends, close friends, family members that don't eat meat. And I think I think it's they're all in exactly the same kind of viewpoint. Their, their viewpoint is they just can't bring themselves to eat mm -hmm. something that was living. And there's a part of me that uh, does, that does under, completely understands that. I do completely understand. You know, I, I like animals too. And I think that's just where we have to, you know, decide on our own values. You know, a very, very close friend of mine, uh, I think about 18 months ago told me, oh, I'm going vegetarian. I watch Game Changers. I'm going to go vegetarian. And I just said, okay. I said, yeah, see how you get on with it. You know, I wasn't going to try and talk him out of it. 
you know, if it works for him, it works for him. If it doesn't, it doesn't, you know. And the last time I spoke to him, he, I said, how are you getting on with it? And he, and he was like, yeah, I'm not feeling as good as I was. He said, but, you know, I still can't bring myself to eat animals. You know, and, and I think if someone makes that conscious decision, I, I've got more respect for that. If they're saying, look, I know this isn't the healthiest thing for me, but I'm going to do it because I have this value structure. I've mm -hmm. got I've got a level of respect for that. But if someone's what? in denial, as you're saying, you know, I've got a little less respect for that because it's like, no, I'm doing this because it's more healthy, but yet their body's falling apart. Well, it's the same kind of denial you're going to see in somebody who's an omnivore, but they're an alcoholic or they're an omnivore, mm. but they're addicted yeah. to painkillers or they're an omnivore, but they're uh, eating too much sugar and junk food. Um, look, an everyone's got their addictions and yeah. um, and often we're very, very private, very secretive about what we're really doing, what we're really eating. Mm. It's very personal. And you can even be in a close, intimate relationship with someone and not see what they're really doing. I remember um, this morbidly obese friend of mine, she confessed to me once that in order to become so huge, I mean, she had to really eat a lot. And she would do things like go to a store when nobody around that she knew was looking she'd go to another town she'd go to a store and buy like 20 ice cream sandwiches and then go back in her car and eat them all at once um, that level of binging is what it takes to maintain that kind of body mass mm. but mm. it's done very secretively yeah 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 it's an addiction and um, i think my addiction is a vegan you know you start getting addicted to stimulating beverages supplements very stimulating supplements um rock cow eating massive amounts of chocolate um yeah and then these things will then throw your body's balance off you eat too much chocolate you'll end up with cold sores or um pimples be you know it's throwing you off hormonally it's throwing you off because of the caffeine because of mm. the, the plant toxins in it. Yeah, it's yeah. not. But again, in the um, vegan community, this is a superfood. There are a lot of cacao ceremonies where you're actually ingesting large quantities of cacao, very strong cacao. Uh, it makes you high. Yeah. It does. You know, yeah. It was used in Mayan ritual and mm. South American ritual for this reason. But it's not something that we really should be eating all the time every day. Yeah, yeah. One thing, one thing I want to get your opinion on. You know, I, I do look at some people who are vegan, or they mm -hmm. certainly tell everyone they're vegan. But, but on the face of it, they, they they seem very healthy. And there's two people that spring to mind. I mean, you mentioned David Wolf earlier, actually. But a couple of people spring to mind. I'm, you may not know who they are because they're both English, but um, Russell Brand, the comedian oh, yeah. and actor, um, and Lewis Hamilton, who's the Formula One, seven-time Formula One world champion. I'm not familiar with him. Yeah, he's he's the most successful Formula One driver ever, basically. But looking at just those two as examples, I mean, Lewis hasn't been vegan for that long. It might be less than two years. Obviously, Russell mm -hmm. Brand has been a vegan for a long time. And looking at both of them, they both appear, to me, they both appear very healthy. I mean, looking at Lewis, he, you know, I'm sure he works out a lot. Uh, I know Russell Brand does Brazil, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, although I know he does a lot of yoga as well. But why, why do you think it is that there are some people who seemingly, and, you know, I've got no reason to doubt them, seem to be healthy on on a vegan diet. Have you got any views on that? We can never trust anything that a celebrity says <laughs> or does. Um, you know, and I say that as somebody who works one-on-one -on -one with celebrities, it's my career. I'm a publicist. I, I know a lot of celebrities personally, very, um, as friends and as clients, 
I'd be careful and tactful about what I say about that. But um, a lot of vegan influencers have dentures. They're not even 50 years old. They've lost all their teeth and they've replaced them with um, uh, caps and crowns. Um, there's a In the vegan community, there's a constant train of folks going to Mexico to cosmetic dentists to um, get veneers and stuff. A lot of vegan women have but breast, breast implants. Um, people get a lot of plastic surgery. They wear makeup. Um, a lot of vegan girls wear uh, hair um, pieces, even full wigs. Um, you'll see in the African-American girls, a lot of times they've got the cornrows. Even um, some male influencers have hair pieces and hair extensions. Does Russell Brand have hair extensions? We don't know. I, I wouldn't Does know. Does Russell Brand really eat a vegan diet? We don't know. Does mm -hmm. Russell Brand have access to the top celebrity nutritionists and and um, supplements and superfoods that might mm -hmm. help compensate yeah. for the lack in his diet, possibly? Um, but also, you know, uh, lighting and makeup, and um, we we see people from from the outside. We mostly see them in photographs. Um, a lot of times when you meet celebrities in person, they don't look that great. So, yeah. um, you know, worshiping and believing also some, some of the influencers that I was really, uh, intrigued with and enamored with who were so beautiful, looked so healthy, so vibrant, you know, later on you learn, um, the truth of the, of the cheating that goes on, how many people actually eat eggs or even, uh, we're rumored to be eating pork and meat while professing to be vegan influencers. You really don't mm. know. Um, one of the other things is a lot of these supplements that we take as vegans are actually of animal origin. Mm. Well, where do you think vitamin B12 comes from? Now you're seeing vegan collagen. Well, this is a, a product of biotechnology, of of genetic engineering, bioengineering, um, to make these artificial meats and also the artificial um, supplements, or there's a lot of uh, laboratory uh, generated technology that that is producing some of these things. I'm not necessarily against that, mm. but it is a bit hypocritical to be against eating an animal. Uh, and then yet willing to to eat something that we're not really sure uh, it hasn't been tested for generations in the human food chain. We don't really know what what's going to happen yeah. Yeah. from eating these artificial eggs, artificial dairy products, artificial fats. Yeah, I mean, again, in that respect, <laughs> that's not how we evolved. No, so it isn't. I, I would be very confident that in the long term, they wouldn't be a good thing to, to be ingesting. But there's so much um, programming telling us that eating animals is bad, it's toxic, it's evil, it's mean, it's cruel, it's unhealthy, it's toxic, it gives you cancer. And when you you get that, it's, it's very, 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 very hard to um, eat an animal-sourced food. And I get traumatized if I go on Twitter now and type in the word vegan and start reading the feeds and it's it's uh it's just a parade of cruelty, right? You see hmm. um pictures of, of animals being treated in the most horrific ways. Um I'm my God, if I had been subjected to anything like that in two thousand and two when I made this the decision to go vegan. Uh, but there, there wasn't any content like that at the time. I only had books. It was words mm. and descriptions. But kids today are getting this this graphic violence mm. that is honestly not always real. Yeah, it's been it's been manipulated. Um, uh, in some other interviews, I've mentioned that our culture also. Recent culture has anthropomorphized animals 
and turn them into characters. And through CGI, Hollywood creates these animals that have personalities that are very human in in movies. Mm. Um, and, you know, when I was a kid growing up, yeah, we had Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Sesame Street. And we had puppets or hand-drawn cartoons. But now you have these hyper-realistic video games and and virtual reality and these movies with animals that appear to 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 have these human characteristics um yeah. another thing is, is just the, the worship of pets now i mean when i was growing up you had a pet but i remember we had cats they were mostly feral you know they ran around outside you kept them outdoors um, you had a dog, your dog was for hunting or for protection, but now people are carrying their pets around everywhere they go. They're even in San Francisco, tea houses and, and cafes where you're allowed to bring your cat into a cafe, cat cafes. There are dog days in the park and dog friendly restaurants and this um, pet friendly accommodations now are the norm with Airbnb and hotels. They have to accommodate pets. So do restaurants. And uh, a lot of um, childless couples, you know, have a pet now as sort of a substitute child. And so when you get very intimately bonded with your cat or your dog or even your goldfish or something, um, it becomes harder and harder to think about eating animals, right? Mm. Yeah, and absolutely. I have to wonder how much of this is normal in our human evolution to completely go against our human nature, which was that eating animals made us better, it made us stronger, gave us an evil, evolutionary advantage. You wanted to put bacon, you know, bring home the bacon, put meat on the table. Your, your the man of the house wanted to, you know, bring home this abundance for his family, and now you, um, you know, the, the land of milk and honey, right? These were. This was our culture when I was a kid growing up. My father hunted. Everybody's everybody hunted when I was a kid growing up. Um, mm. It was normal to go fishing on a vacation. As a child, I would fish. My dad me how to kill fish, how to um, gut the fish, and you know we learned how to pluck the birds. And if, if you grew up on a farm, uh, you know, I would visit my uncle's dairy farm and milk milk cows. This was just normal. It was part of growing up. But as we've become more urbanized and more distant from the source of our food, and it's really been outsourced, mm. right? It's been outsourced to other people. Corporations have taken it over. Other countries have taken it over. And we're more and more distant from it, even to the point where a lot of people now don't even know how to cook. Mm -hmm. let alone you know butcher a chicken and cut it up to make soup yeah they don't even know how to make soup and and it's it's sad really how yeah. how distance we've become from food and agriculture if we can't hunt if we can't grow food if we can't cook food we become very reliant on the state to provide those things for us Absolutely. And then if we don't have money, we become reliant on uh, food stamps and food banks. Mm -hmm. And you see that happening more and more. And is this by design to, you know, make make our population weak, submissive, subservient? Um, even hunting is becoming increasingly outlawed in mm -hmm. many communities. You're not allowed to hunt yeah. anymore. You're not allowed to go into the government land and and hunt. I mean, you can do it in um, in Arizona and Texas and other states, but it's increasingly difficult in the state of California. Mm. Um, we're told not to fish because the water is polluted. Yeah. You know, mercury levels don't eat fish. But how much of this is really true? Yeah, I just want yeah. to take you back. I just want to. I just want to kind of finish off the the original question. Yeah. 
So we were talking about people who, you know, eat a vegan diet and seem to, you know, be perfectly healthy. I think my my view seem on... Seem to be. Yeah. I mean, my, my view on Russell Brand and Lewis Hamilton, they have one thing in common. They're both very rich. <laughs> right? Russell Brand is a millionaire. Lewis Hamilton is a billionaire. They've got plenty of money. If let's, you know, I mean, my my intuition tells me to I can trust Russell Brand. A lot of people might disagree with that, but I my intuition tells me that he's he's genuine. And I I can look at people. You know, I've been in this game a long time. I can look at people and generally get a good idea of how healthy they are. You know, Russell Russell's got a little bit of body fat around the middle, but you know he's 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 almost fifty years old. You know, that's that's kind of fair enough. Lewis Hamilton, you know, is is one of the highest paid athletes on the planet, if not the highest paid athlete on the planet. He's got plenty of people around him to help him with his his diet, his nutrition, his exercise, and everything else. You know, he's got his private jets, and you know, I'm sure when he's traveling, he's probably sleeping in his private jet, getting all the rest that he needs. Right. So let let's just assume both of them are honest and both of them are healthy. They've got the 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 means to make up for any deficiencies that they might have in their diet through supplementation and, and everything else. But who knows? Who knows? The other thing I just wanted to mention whilst you were talking was, you know, when you were talking about these horrible videos that people are seeing, well, the fact is that most most animal farming is done in a terrible way, right? Most animals are fed toxic feed they're kept in completely inhumane circumstances. You know, most of these animals live in a cage, sometimes with other animals in the same cage. They don't ever see sunlight. They don't ever graze on a field. They're they're standing in their own feces and urine, as you mentioned earlier, and they're eating from that same floor, right? They're eating... Mm-hmm from a floor that's covered in urine and feces. So from that perspective, I'm I'm a hundred percent with anyone who's against that. Right? Well Are you a personal trainer, exercise professional, or medical professional who wants to upskill and take your knowledge to the next level? And would you like to take a class and be taught personally by me? I'm of course talking about Czech Integrative Movement Science Level 1 in Lancashire, England on the 25th to the 29th of October, 2023. I'll be teaching a clinically tested system that makes sense of the entire health and fitness journey from anatomy to assessment to program design and coaching. You will learn 40 assessments, 60 conditioning exercises and 27 program design principles. And the Czech framework brings them all together into an incredibly adaptable and effective system. From assessments to exercises to program design and coaching, This is a complete system. Students who master that system can create powerful programs that are tailored specifically to their individual clients' needs, abilities, and motivations. If you're serious about your work and want to take it to the next level, you can enroll on Czech Integrative Movement Science Level 1 with me in Lancashire in the north of England on the 25th to the 29th of October 2023. And you'll need to enroll by the end of June to complete the three fantastic prerequisite online classes program design, scientific core conditioning, and scientific back training that will prepare you greatly for your IMS1 class. For more details, check out the link in the show notes, but don't delay, places are limited. I hope to see you there. Well, I think veganism, the movement, is one of the reasons why uh, we have better quality animal foods available now. Um, it raised the awareness, my friends and I raised the awareness as activists of, of animal cruelty. And now the carnivore movement is taking it a step further. I mean, once you go into a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet and start eating predominantly animal-based foods, you get really particular about uh, the sources. Um, more and more Carnivores are actively involved in either, in, if they're wealthy, they're investing in uh, ranches and farms. Um, the, you're seeing um, 
a, a farm to table movement now, including not just vegetables, but animal products. Um, a lot of people order, uh, you know, a quarter of a cow or half a cow and have it butchered and um, they keep it in a deep freezer. I mean, you've got to be wealthy to do that mm. just yeah. to pay for the energy to keep it frozen all the time. Yeah. On top of, of buying that much food in advance, even though it does save money in the long run. But, um, you know, even if you're of modest means, it's pretty easy now to find um, ethically sourced products. And most of us who live in urban areas are not that far away from farms. We think we're far away from farms, mm. but if you go take a trip into the countryside or you, you know, you look on a map and see um, what's near you, at least here in California, I mean, I'm no more than two hours in any direction from some of the best food in the world. And, mm. um, and, and the bread basket of the planet is right here. I mean, almost everything is available and there are good sources and you just have to do your research and find them mm. and either buy direct or, you know, you go to the smaller butchers and it's been a wonderful journey for me. I mean, an hour and a half from here, I can go to the town of Ojai, which is inland of Santa Barbara. And I, I looked on Google maps. Where's the butcher? I found a butcher in Ojai, kind of on the fringes of town, right next to the ranches where I could get organic chicken, organic bacon, organic beef, um, and, and organ meats and everything literally from across the street, from the farm across the street from them and mm. of the highest quality. And it was cheaper than Whole Foods. I couldn't believe it. Mm. Right, well, it was that cheaper than the grocery me. store. <laughs> um, if you shop on specials and you look for discounts and and stock up when things go on sale, um, you know you can find local farmers on Craigslist. I, the other day, I started looking for eggs on Craigslist. I couldn't believe how many people sell eggs directly for um, a less money than the grocery store the same price mm. of their own eggs that they they produce yeah. and i've raised chickens before it'd be pretty hard to be mean to a chicken let me tell you <laughs> 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 it's like the the once you start raising animals you realize that a lot of these things that we think are cruel really aren't very often it's what the animal prefers and I'll give you an example with chickens. Um, one time when I was raising chickens, I turned my, we were letting them free range out in the backyard, which they love. They love to go out and run around, but they don't go that far. They usually, as you hear the saying, birds of a flat feather flock together. They like to stick together. So all six or 12 hens will be closely walking together as they run around and look for bugs and worms, which is their best food. They're carnivores. Mm. And um, they dig and scratch in the dirt and look for bugs. That's what they do all day mm. long. That's all they do. They're, they're not going out and um, going to concerts or <laughs> dancing or all the stuff that we humans do. What animals do all day long is basically eat and try not to get eaten and killed. That's mm -hmm. their life, you know? And um, at night you have to let them indoors into a, a closed area. So they're safe from predators. And as soon as the sun goes down, the chickens know this and they will, they'll, they'll voluntarily make their way to the hen house. And the hen house doesn't need to be that big. Because it doesn't matter if you have a 20 by 20 meter hen house, that it doesn't matter. They're all going to cram into the corner of it because they mm. like to cuddle mm. to stay warm. And all the chickens will be in the corner of it. So you don't need a big house for them. They're okay with a little house. Mm. I mean, they like it. Mm. That's the thing you learn when you raise animals is a lot of these things are just what the animals like. And they like being indoors. Look at your cat or your dog. They, you could, you have a whole yard. You could let them outside. They don't want to be out there. They want to be inside where it's warm and cozy. Mm. 
Mm. Well, animals are the same way. Farm animals, they don't mind being indoors. Um, you know, it's so, so, uh, you know, the, the idea of a free range chicken is cruelty. And one time our chickens were free ranging as I was beginning to tell the story and a hawk came just nose dive down. And I heard this. And then I looked and all I saw was a little pile of feathers. That's all that was left. That's how vulnerable they, they are. A hawk can just come and pick them up from the air and, and they're gone. Um, you know, they're, they're frightened and constantly worried about almost everything is a predator for a little bird. And, you know, nature isn't gentle in nature, Mm. in nature, these animals have uh, a a much tougher life than they do on a farm. Mm. You know, farm animals get healthcare, they get medication, they get combed and brushed. Um, massaged you know, some of them infested with some kind of lice or something it's it's remediated a farmer has an investment in their in their animals they're not going to abuse them mm. look on twitter look how many branchers are on twitter telling you that a lot of the stuff we hear about animal cruelty is a bunch of bs well the, the other thing as well and again i discussed this with jane buxton on the podcast that you know with arable farming it doesn't mean that animals don't die. And, you know, Jane was saying to me, mm-hmm. she interviewed a Californian right. farmer. He farmed avocados. And he said he would he would have to shoot 40,000 gophers every year to to keep his harvest, right? And, you know, when you think about mm-hmm. plowing and tilling and combine harvesters, they just chop up the animals that are on the in the fields anyway. Not to not to mention the destruction of the soils of all the chemical fertilizers and chopping down the trees, which mean the birds and the bees and you know all these lose their environment, which means they die. So there is there is that no there is no life without death. There is no food mm-hmm. without death of animals. Absolutely, and that seems to get lost on on some people, unfortunately. Again, because we're so distant from the source of our food yeah. that that um, propaganda. And outright lies are fed to us through social media, and we believe this stuff. Yeah. So I want to move on a little bit now. So six months into your vegan lifestyle, things started to go awry. 18 years later, you decide, okay, this isn't for me anymore. What what does a vegan recovery journey look like? Well, the, the first step... To recovering as a vegan usually involves a health scare, a health mm-hmm. crisis, and my health deteriorated. It was one thing after another, after another, after another, and it's not a, a linear journey down. You know, you have your ups and your downs and your moments when maybe you go back to eating eggs for a while, or you eat a little bit of cheese for a while. Or I was at a party and very hungry once, and I grabbed a um salmon skewers off of a plate because it was the closest thing to me um so you know and then in the vegan world they'll say you were cheating you weren't really a vegan oh you know so anyway the end stage veganism when you reach that rock bottom where you might start questioning your diet it usually takes a major catastrophe. This is cancer, um, a major injury, sports injury, or in my case, I was injured in an automobile accident, I had a neck injury, and that sent me to a chiropractor. And the the beginning of the neck injury journey started with a chiropractor, and my chiropractor just happened to be paleo. He was into the paleo diet. And I remember limping into his office in intractable all over body pain. And he would be working on me and working on me and working on me, trying to um, deal with my soft tissue injuries and, and my, my, you know, my body was a total mess. And he started saying, you know, I really think you should take some omega-3 fatty acids. And he prescribed to me an omega-369. And like, why? 
why do I need this? And he mm. said, because it will help you with inflammation. And I was like, what is inflammation? He explained to me the reason why you were in pain is because of inflammation. Pain is from inflammation. And what is inflammation from? Generally, our diet. Imbalances in our diet, particularly between the omega-6 and the omega-3 fatty acids. The mm -hmm. omega-6 is in plants. Omega-3, the only really good sources of omega-3 fatty acids are from eggs that have seen the sunlight, from fish, deep water fish that ate uh, seaweed and krill. And you have um, uh, land salmon, another word for lamb. You mm -hmm. have animals like lamb and cattle who have been eating grass and capturing the sunlight energy from the grass, converting that into the omega-3 fatty acids. That's another great source of omega-3. Of course, none of those were things I was eating on a regular mm. basis as a vegan. And so I had severe inflammation. And if you look at before photos of me, I was an end-stage vegan four years ago when I started this journey. I was very inflamed. My face was noticeably inflamed and puffy. I had so much malnutrition, dark, dark, dark circles under my eyes, could not cover them up with concealer. They were so dark. And then underneath those bruise like dark circles that you see typically in end stage vegans were bags. And mm. there were bags under the bags. I had like three stages of bags, unattractive, mm. plus deep, deep lines and wrinkles in my face. And deep, deep, deep nasolabial folds. Um, a lot of women who are on these plant-based diets, what what we'll do is get injections and fillers, uh, where, where you're getting actual collagen and or synthetic collagen injected into your body because of your own lack of collagen. You know, where mm -hmm. you're getting collagen creams and collagen treatments on your face because of your own lack of collagen because you're not eating it yeah. and all of the connective tissue in your body your your ligaments your joints is made from we can't make that out of plants yeah. we need to eat it from animals we need to eat the collagen of animals the connective tissue and the ligaments of animals to build our own i didn't know that at the time Mm -hmm. So I had this, 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 not only did I look awful, I, I was exhausted, so tired, so, 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 so tired. That's another thing that you'll hear from the end stage vegans. I'm just so exhausted all the time. So you're just constantly lying down and taking a nap, can't function, you can't work, can't even drive. I mean, I, I couldn't drive more than, say, 15 minutes before I had to just crawl into the back of my car and take a nap. Um, I would go to parties and I would get tired and need to, 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 to take a nap. Um, you know, just ridiculous. Uh, the, the fatigue, the chronic fatigue and um, lack of vitality and, and mental fatigue. But not only that, I couldn't sleep. And I asked my chiropractor, who was also a nutritionist, you know, how come I can't sleep? What should I do to sleep? And he says, eat protein. He said, eat protein first thing in the morning, eat a protein snack every couple of hours, and eat a protein snack before bed. I'm like, what? Protein? How's that going to help me sleep? Mm -hmm. He explained cortisol and how. You know, eating the the sweet breakfast that I was having, the big fruit smoothie, was jacking up my insulin and causing this this uh, uh, cortisol cycle that leads to not only the fatigue but the inability to sleep at night. Mm. And I was so desperate to to sleep. I was so unable to sleep between the pain I was experiencing after my accident and the the, the symptoms of end stage veganism, which were all just sort of crashing on me all at once. But I did what he suggested: protein first thing instead of coffee and a smoothie. Um, 
protein at night before I went to bed and I slept. And I came into the office the next day and I was crying. I was so static. I said, I slept <laughs> last night. I slept. I can't believe it. I actually slept. And he said, of course. And so I picked his brain during those sessions. I saw that chiropractor about 70 times for treatments. And I would just, every minute I was asking him questions and learning. And he and his wife looked so great. They were paleo which is something I had never heard of really at the time. You know, I didn't really know what that was. I had tried like paleo vegetarian, but I didn't realize it really being paleo meant you had to eat meat. Mm. And um, so I gradually started reaching this realization, but it took me about six more months of deprogramming. And that was when I started going down the rabbit hole. I was so weak. All I could do is pretty much lie on the couch and dictate into Siri. And I would, I was on Twitter and that's when I became the recovering vegan. I started my account. And the reason I started this account with a fake photo of me hiding behind a bunch of <laughs> greens and um, not showing my face, not my real name was I did not want my friends and family who were vegan to know I was doing this. Mm. I was in the closet and even learning about meat, the keto diet was something I had to do in total secrecy. And why did you feel that way? Uh, because I, I would have been alienated and, and ridiculed mm. by everybody I knew. Ostracized. I mean, ostracized. Well, I was. I was ostracized. Once I was vocal and started coming out of the closet and doing these interviews um, and and press coverage. And I mean, I have 13,000 followers on Twitter now, reaching millions of people. I couldn't keep that a secret from my friends anymore. Mm. And I started becoming more outspoken because I saw so many people sick and struggling with with health problems and even dying, um, lost a lot of my friends, lost a lot of very close friends who died prematurely, I would say, uh, who were, were strict vegetarians and vegans. It's very and sad. I just felt like I have to, I, I can't let this happen anymore. Once I realized and came to the awareness, which was a long, slow, gradual process. Um, and, to to help other vegans deprogram, I I can name a couple of you know. Of course, you can follow me, but you can also follow um, there. I have a list on Twitter of over forty doctors. I have lists of nutritionists and um, health coaches that I've created painstakingly created these lists of people that you can follow who are authorities. You can read the book by Jane Buxton. You mm -hmm. can read Sally's book, and you can read Dr. Paul Saladino's book. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of great books now um, about um, the you know more and more information, and I think you know we're we're seeing um, a new awareness. But that all didn't exist four years ago. Those books hadn't been written yet, yeah. and um, yeah, I I've followed some people on YouTube. Uh, someone named Gotis. Uh, some of these people have been disappeared or even um, had so many death threats from vegans that they had to stop producing content on YouTube. Um, there's one called Vegan. Oh, there, there's a couple uh, on vegan recovery, vegan disinformation, vegan malnutrition. And I just binge watched over and over watch these videos of ex-vegans talking about how they hit rock bottom in their health problems. And I started seeing very similar stories to my own, very similar problems mm. that they were experiencing. So how long has it been since you started eating meat again? I started uh, February 23rd of 2022 was when I started a keto diet 
I started a full carnivore diet on January 1 of mm-hmm. this year. Yeah. And although eating meat again and lowering my carbohydrate intake to 20 to 40 carbs per day on the ketogenic diet was was very transformative, um, the real deep healing has happened as a carnivore. Wow. So what, what changes have you experienced? Yesterday morning, I woke up and I I realized my eyesight is better. <laughs> That's an incredible one. And this morning too. I mean, I I got up and just I'm starting to see things too. That's what's really cool, you know. Like or a little scary, you know. It's like what are those spider webs on the ceiling? It's so <laughs> dirty on the ceiling. I never saw the spider webs before, but now all of a sudden I'm seeing dirt. I'm seeing dirt on the floor you know, stains on my clothes and it's embarrassing, really. It's like <laughs> I couldn't see it. Couldn't see it before. So eyesight's and, better. Uh, but dramatically well. changing. Uh, fewer floaters in my eyes. Mm-hmm. That started happening right away on the carnivore diet. But more and more, it's a lot of this is from the detoxification of the oxalates that had built up in my joints and body tissues. Um, so of how, course, how are, you know, great yeah. How, are your, how are your joints now? My joints, you know, my arthritis is so severe. Uh, that's not going to clear up overnight. I have mm. I have spondylitis, right. stenosis, myelopathy. Um, I have, is, that, is that from the accident or is that yes. just from bone mineral density due to lack of animal protein? A lot protein? of this didn't show up until the accident. So what, what a, a trauma to like a whiplash or a trauma to your neck can do. And this is what one of my doctors explained to me is it can unleash things hidden in your nervous system Mm. that were dormant. Mm. And then these, these um, diseases, rare diseases just suddenly appear. And so for me, it was, was autoimmune conditions that were very suddenly um, uh, and, you know, with the, the, with the spondylitis you have, the flares, these horrible um, arthritis flares where your joints blow up, visibly swell up and your body swells up. But accompanying that is intestinal flare up too. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a gut, uh, there's some sort of relationship. You may be aware of this, of the the gut absolutely, and the the gut microbiota Mm -hmm. and these forms of arthritis and, and understanding this is all, I think, nascent. It's all fairly new. Um, but I'm starting to, through my own research and, um, you know, Sally Norton's work, for example, understanding that eating those green smoothies every day for 18 years, green smoothies, green soups, green, green powders, gave my body this, this tremendous overload of oxalate, which the body hides in the tissues and once you stop eating the oxalate and you eat an all meat or all animal based diet the body releases it and starts detoxing the toxins from the vegetables which are stored in your joints and your organs now this makes me sound like a crackpot to vegans (laughs) who think that all these green vegetables are healthy but you, you need to go down the rabbit hole and learn the truth about kale, learn the truth about superfoods, learn the truth about um, the oxalates, which are like a crystal, like a shard, almost like a little under a microscope. They look like crystals. They're almost like little shards of glass and they're inside the the seeds of fruits such as raspberries are surrounded with a ring of these oxalate crystals to protect the seed because Mm. the seed wants to be eaten in a fruit and then defecated out. So it goes into the soil so it can be fertilized, so it can become a plant. That's how the plant reproduces. That seed is its baby and it protects the baby with these these little crystals. Mm. But what we're doing now which is unprecedented in all of history, is taking those raspberries and blueberries and and other oxalate-rich foods and putting them in these high-speed blenders 
which have only existed for the last 20 or 30 years, Vitamixes and Nutribullets and stuff. And we're breaking those seeds up and those little oxalate crystals, which were never meant to be broken up, they become like shrapnel, right? They're, they, they're filling that drink. You're eating this, this oxalate filled drink where not only are there oxalates in toxic, even deadly levels, but they have been released from the seeds as nature never intended. And you're just poisoning yourself. And that can um, cause problems like for women, you can end up with vulvodyna, where the, the oxalates are trapped in the tissues of the vulva, causes sexual pain, can cause, um, can be related. And now there's um, a research showing that oxalate is implicated in breast tumors. We don't know 100% for sure if it's causing breast cancer, but it's certainly implicated and, and can be contained in those tumors. Um, of course, we've known for a very long time that oxalate uh, is causative for um, kidney stones, for bladder stones, for uh, you know that that we've always known. But we're now we're learning that that it's causing problems throughout the body. Mm. Uh, Sally Norton's book is an excellent source mm. for her website information about that. So the, so that also becomes implicated in in autoimmune disease, right? complicated story yeah so you've been carnivore for about three to four months now yes what's been if you could just sum up the overall kind of experience of that how has it been for you i didn't finish my breakfast yet this morning <laughs> but going carnivore is kind of a lot like this <laughs> you eat a lot more eggs than nice. i've already eaten some of this so you know i might make six eggs and half a package of bacon, like six strips of bacon and six eggs. And if it's a really good day and I've got enough time to make a big breakfast, I might have a steak with that. And um, if I do drink a hot beverage or a coffee that might be with um, collagen in it, grass-fed collagen, heavy cream, um, big chunk of butter, a little bit of coconut oil in that, and some minerals. I um, now mineralize the supplements I take are minerals primarily. And yeah. um, this is just a radical change in how I eat. And it's so different than, 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 you know, what I've eaten maybe since I lived in France or since I was a child. And, um, and it, the, the, the transformation is so profound that you feel it almost immediately. And what, what changes have you, have you experienced? Well, the first thing that you notice is a clarity of mind mm -hmm. and a focus and the ability to just meditate and be peaceful, tranquility. Um, now, again, this is counterintuitive. Mm. Wouldn't you think yeah. that vegan diet, yeah. which they always have in the ashrams and the meditation centers would mm -hmm. be the... The diet that makes you um, calm and peaceful, it, it it does make you calm and peaceful to a certain extent to 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 uh, eat a, a all vegetable diet. And that's probably why uh, it's promoted in those places. But the um, the the nutrients, the satiety also mm -hmm. from the carnivore diet mm -hmm. when you're eating meat. The fats yeah. are so satiating. You don't spend as much time eating and cooking. You might only eat once a day. Um, and you don't get hungry. You don't feel like snacking. Um, there's so much time freed up for other things because you're not thinking about food all the time. Um, save a lot of money. I don't need so many supplements. I don't need so many things. Mm. It's simple. And... Um, you know, it's it's helping me with my uh, pain, mm -hmm. uh, this dramatic uh, reduction in inflammation, walking better. That's been absolutely transformational. Um, 
walking with less pain, less pain uh, from plantar fasciitis, less joint pain, less muscle pain, less pain, pain, sleeping. Oh my God, the sleep. Carnivores will tell you almost immediately you start sleeping better. And the sleep is deep, dreamy. Mm -hmm. You know, you get your REM sleep back. And that sleep enables your body to heal, mm. that rest. Yeah. Um, awesome. I don't know. What else can I say? Awesome. You know, awesome. yeah, just sound, look better. Sounds like you've been on a, yeah. quite a journey. Lost 21 pounds. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Giselle, I could I could talk to you all day, but we're we're pretty much running out of time. But a question I'm going to ask you that I ask everyone, what, what's next for Giselle? Well, I'm supposed to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to do something with this following. And um, and the following has even asked me to write a book. So I, I will be working on a book. I'm also Fantastic. looking at moving mm -hmm. um, into a, a community where I'll be closer to farmers and agriculture again. Mm. Maybe buying a property where I could raise my own chickens and have a beehive. So I'm sounds really great. excited about that. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Yeah, it's my life dream. Mm. And I'll also have an herb garden. And that, I mean, I I believe that um, animals are food and plants are medicine. So plants are here to help us, our helpers. They're wonderful, you know. I mean, wonderful, wonderful qualities in so many mm. plants, especially the herbs. And, um, and uh, but they're just not meant to be eaten in these large quantities. Yeah, yeah. And where can people find you online? At um, well, you can go to my link tree at Recovering Vegan. I'm at Vegan Recovering on Twitter. Uh, the Recovering Vegan on Instagram. Awesome. And Recovering Vegan on Facebook. Fantastic. Giselle, thank you so much for coming on the show and you know sharing your experiences with veganism and also carnivore living with the audience. Thank you for inviting me to have this discussion with you and bringing credibility to um, the carnivore diet and ex-veganism with your nutritional knowledge. No, it's, been, it's been my pleasure. So that's all from Giselle and me for this week. But don't forget, you can join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to give the show a rating and a review and I'll see you next time. <laughs>